Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our virtual HOA Condo Academy number seven um, for the month of July 2023. Today, we're going to be talking about understanding the hierarchy of association documents. Um, we're going to be talking about a five-step plan for amending your CCNRs. And we're also going to be talking about how to, to respond to an owner's record request for documents of the association. So welcome today to our class number seven um, of our virtual HOA Condo Academy in partnership with the cities of Avondale, Chandler, Glendale, Goodyear, Mesa, Peoria, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Surprise, and Tempe. My name is Beth Mulcahy, and I'm the managing partner and senior attorney of the Mulcahy Law Firm in Phoenix, Arizona. I've enjoyed representing HOAs and condominiums for the past 26 years or over 26 years, actually 27 in November. Um, my firm currently represents over a thousand planned communities and condominium associations throughout the state of Arizona. I also currently serve on my HOA board and have for many years. Before we dive into the meat of the seminar today, I'd like to start off by getting a feel for who's here today um, so I can tailor the information that I present um, to best serve all of you who are here in attendance today. So we're gonna be uh, doing two polls right now at the same time. So if you're joining us on Zoom, the polls will be on your screen. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, um, well, all I would ask that you do is just answer these questions in the comments section. Um, the first question is, which city um, do you reside or which city is your association located in? Um, and then the second question is, um, let us know what your current role is for the association. Are you a board member? Are you a community manager? Are you an interested homeowner um, or some other relationship to the community? Um, and so we're gonna let you answer those two poll questions. Um, and while we're doing that, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the new legislation. Um, as some of you may know, um, we always at the beginning of these classes do a little brief summary of what's going on in the Arizona legislature. And just a brief summary is to this is a very unusual year um, for the Arizona legislature. I can think of maybe only one time in the 25 years or 25 plus years that I've been monitoring the legislation that the legislature is still in session um, in July um, of the year. Remember, our legislature in Arizona is a seasonal legislature. Um, and so typically they're finished by April, May, June at the latest. Um, this year, um, our uh, legislature is still in session. Right now, they're in recess um, until July 31st, 2023. And then when they come back, we're not exactly sure what they're going to do. Um, they may try to get a few more bills passed um, and, and tie up the session in a week, or they may just open the session and then immediately close it. It's going to be a big question mark uh, on July 31st. So stay tuned. Um, right now, um, as of right now, we do have five new bills pertaining to HOAs and condominiums in Arizona that have been signed into law by the governor. And what that means is that 90 days after the legislative session ends this year, um, those bills will go into effect. And so we don't know the exact date that they're going to become the law um, because the session hasn't closed yet for 2023. Um, of the five bills, we have a great summary um, that we are going to be sharing with you right now um, on um, Facebook Live and also on Zoom. Um, and we also have the same summary listed on our firm's website at mulcahylawfirm.com. So I encourage you to take a look at those five bills. As we get closer to the legislative session ending or the session actually ends, I'm going to spend a little bit of time doing a deep dive on the new legislation and talking through all aspects of it. Most of the bills are pretty self-explanatory. Probably the only bill that's going to require some sort of action is if you are a planned community and your streets have been dedicated to the public, you're going to need to have a vote conducted um, to determine whether or not you want to continue being able to allow those publicly dedicated streets to be um, um, you know, to have enforcement of parking and speeding, et cetera, on those, on those um, publicly owned streets in a planned community. Um, in the meantime, let's go back and take a look at um, our poll results. So um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, it looks like we have a very good representation from almost all the cities that we work with here for these classes. Chandler has 7%, Glendale has 3%, 
Goodyear has 9%. Mesa has 17%, um, which is a big uptick. Great job, Mesa. Peoria has 7%. Phoenix has 17%. Scottsdale, 29%. Surprise, 4%. And Tempe, 6%. And in terms of our demographics for who's here today, 68% um, of you are board members, 13% are managers, 17% are interested homeowners, and 1% are other. So welcome everybody for being here today. Um, it looks like we have over 113 participants already here today on this hot July day um, in Arizona. Hopefully some of you are away in cooler locations. Um, and some of you are getting away for a break from the heat this, this summer at some point. Okay, let's just dive right into um, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, the first subject that we're going to talk about is the hierarchy of association documents. So just as a baseline, what are the documents for an association? Um, we have, um, you know, the plat map for the association, the CCNRs or the declaration, the articles of incorporation, the bylaws, the rules and regulations of the association, maybe architectural guidelines. Um, and so oftentimes we're asked, what's the hierarchy or which document is the most important? Or if there is a conflict between the documents, um, which document controls? And so I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about what each document is, and then also what's the hierarchy in case there's any sort of a conflict between the documents, which does happen often, um, surprisingly. Okay, so the hierarchy is pretty simple. I'm just going to do that up front. Um, the plat map is at the top. The CCNRs are second. Articles of incorporation are third. The bylaws are fourth. The rules and regulations are fifth. And then any architectural guidelines you would have would be after that. So Plat, CCNRs, Articles of Incorporation, Bylaws, Rules, and Architectural Guidelines. So in the event that there's a conflict, let's say, for example, between the bylaws and the CCNRs, like let's say the bylaws say that the board shall consist of nine members, and the CCNRs say that the board shall consist of three members, um, you always want to go back to the hierarchy, and the CCNRs will control because it's higher up in the hierarchy. Um, we have a great cheat sheet on this topic, um, which I would encourage you to take a look at. We're going to be sharing it with you on Zoom and on Facebook Live, and it talks more about the hierarchy in case you weren't able to write it down as I'm teaching the class here today. Okay, let's talk about, and I'm going to go through what the documents mean in the order of the hierarchy right now. Um, so the plat is the highest document in the hierarchy, and um, all subdivisions Anytime you have an HOA or condo subdivision, um, the plat has to be approved by the city or county that you live in. Um, and then the plat has to be recorded with the Maricopa County Recorder's Office or whatever county's recorder's office that you live in. Um, the plat basically is just a big map and it identifies the lots and units that are going to be subject to um, separate ownership. And also it identifies where the common areas are. So. Sometimes you have a, a very, you know, few page plat map, or if you have a larger association, it could be, you know, maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten pages. Um, but basically, it's just a map of your association, and it outlines where the lots or units are and where the common areas are. And it also talks a little bit about, like, dedication of the streets, like who owns the streets? Are they part of the common areas or are they being dedicated to the city? Um, it talks about um, in the key where there may be easements for utilities and um, other important information regarding the land that the association is situated on. Okay, the next document in the hierarchy is the declaration or the CCNRs. And that is a slang for the Declaration of Covenants, Conditions and Restrictions. Um, the CCNRs are the enabling document that creates covenants and restrictions that run with the land and are binding on all owners. So think of it this way, the CCNRs are a contract between the association and the owners. Um, this document is also recorded with the county recorder's office um, well before the association, you know, starts, the developer starts selling the property, the lots or the units. Um, basically, the declaration outlines the use restrictions for the association, like what owners can and can't do on the property, 
maintenance responsibilities, who's responsible for maintaining what, the association or the owner, insurance requirements, um, responsibility to pay assessments, um, you know, use restrictions on the property, like maybe you're not allowed to run a business out of your home, or, um, you know, maybe the, the highest height of the roof line is defined in the CCNRs. So, Basically, think of the CCNRs as your go-to document when there are questions pertaining to can an owner or the association do something regarding um, the use and enjoyment of the property, um, and also as the contractual obligation um, to um, pay assessments for owners and for the board to create a budget with those with that assessment income. Okay, the next item in the hierarchy are the Articles of Incorporation. Um, the Articles of Incorporation establish the association as a legal entity with the Arizona Corporation Commission. Now, 99.99% of all associations in Arizona are set up as a nonprofit corporation. Um, and it's very important that you're set up as a nonprofit corporation and that the paperwork is typically filed before um, the any of the lots are sold. It's typically something that's done right at the same time that the CCNRs are recorded and this paperwork is filed with the Corporation Commission. And it basically just sets the association up as a nonprofit corporation. And why is that important? It's important because um, we don't want any of the owners to have personal liability for any aspect of the association. If there's you know, litigation or there's a judgment against the association, there's a corporate shield that is placed around the association, the HOA or the condominium association, and it prevents others from piercing that veil and going after the owners in the association or the board members in the association personally. So your personal um, assets and resources are protected by the association being incorporated um, as a nonprofit corporation. Um, a good little piece of homework for those of you who are here today, would be to go to the Corporation Commission website and um, just Google Arizona Corporation Commission and um, you can type in the name of your association and do a search to see if you're in good standing with the Corporation Commission. Every year you have to file an annual report, the board does this or maybe your management company does this for you with the Corporation Commission and you pay a small fee and if you don't do it after a certain number of years, um, well, after one year, you become in, in bad standing. And then after a few years after that, not doing it, you may be revoked as a nonprofit corporation. And that's a big problem because that corporate shield is now no longer there protecting all of the individual owner's assets. So a little piece of homework would be go to the Corporation Commission website for Arizona type in your association's name and look under the standing provision, whether or not you're in good standing. Um, one other thing that you can do is you can send a reminder, have um, the Corporation Commission send you a reminder email um, with, I think it's 30 or 60 days before your annual report is due each year. The Corporation Commission stopped uh, sending paper reminders to file your annual report um, probably a decade ago. And so you really have to have this on your radar every year that you need to do this. Um, and a good way to get the reminder is to have the Corporation Commission um, send you the reminder email that you have to sign up to do that, to get the reminder email each year. Okay, the next um, item in the hierarchy is the association's bylaws. Um, the bylaws are kind of the how to run the association. So it's used for the internal government and operation of the association. Typically, the bylaws will cover, um, you know, how many board members there should be. When is your annual meeting? Um, it will talk a little bit about um, suspension of voting rights, maybe. Um, it will outline the positions of officer. Um, it will talk about, um, you know, just a number of internal organization type things for how your board runs. Um, it also oftentimes talks about the election of directors and how to appoint a director um, to the board if somebody resigns. Um, and so this is an important document for the internal governance of your association. Okay, the next document is the rules and regulations. Um, and the board is, is usually empowered in the CCNRs or the bylaws to adopt rules and regulations regarding the association's common areas and or behavior of residents within the community. 
Now, every association has a different set of CCNRs. And so, you know, sometimes there's very broad language in the CCNRs about passing rules. Like sometimes it'll say that the board can prom promulgate rules regarding any aspect of the association that's pretty broad, or you could have a more limited, um, you know, provision that gives you rulemaking authority. Like the board can only um, promulgate rules regarding um, the owner's behavior on the common areas. Um, and so you have to look at each association's documents to determine um, how broad your rulemaking authority is. Okay, so um, typically what we see with the rules would be, um, you know, rules regarding maybe the speed limit in the association, pool rules, common area rules, keeping your pets on a leash type rules. Typically they're about one page. Um, and um, if your board is creating rules or amending your rules, it's a really good idea to have your association's legal counsel look at them because sometimes what some associations do is they, they try to pass a rule that conflicts with the CCNRs. Like let's say that the CCNRs say, um, you know, that owners are able to rent their property. And the board decides, well, we want to have a minimum 30 day rental period in our association. So we're going to pass a rule that says no owner can rent for less than 30 days. Well, that is not something that is legal because that type of a restriction would need to be in the CCNRs. Um, and it also conflicts with what the CCNRs say because right now the CCNRs allow for unlimited, um, you know, time periods for rentals. Um, and so when you're working on your rules, amendments definitely run those by your legal counsel for your association, just as a precaution to make sure that you're um, you know, doing them properly and it's not conflicting with any other documents. You don't have any language in there that might conflict with the Fair Housing Act um, that could be perceived as discriminatory. Um, and so just a really good idea, practice pointer to make sure you run those by your legal counsel. Um, the next document that we talk about frequently um, would be like the architectural guidelines. Not all associations have guidelines, but some do. And this may be like paint colors for your association, um, setbacks that are required, building setbacks, um, you know, really any sort of architectural issue that may impact your association. Like if you're going to change your windows out, what type of windows can be used or what type of roofing material? Um, landscaping requirements, you know, possibly for your property. Um, and so again, the architectural guidelines, same thing on, on architectural guidelines, make sure that if you're amending those that you um, are running them by your legal counsel. So that was just a quick little 411 on the documents of the association and their purposes and also the hierarchy for those documents. And again, Check out our cheat sheet um, on, um, you know, what is a community association and, and we go into a deep dive on this topic and you can share it with your board too. Um, if you're interested in doing that, um, it's just a great resource for you to use. Okay, let's talk a little bit about our second topic today, which is amending association documents. Um, and, you know, one thing that I would recommend here today would be um, you know, it's the summer months. Now is a really good time because things seem to slow down and get quieter in our associations in Arizona due to um, the heat. It's a really good time to look at, hey, do our documents need to be updated? Um, and a common question that I get when a client comes to me and asks about amending their documents is, hey, how often should we do it? You know, what's, what's the golden rule on this? Well, there really isn't a golden rule. Um, you know, I, I don't think that you should be amending your documents every few years. I think that's too often, frankly, um, because it's a big process to amend your documents. Um, but what kind of a rule of thumb that I give most of our clients is about every 10 years, you should be thinking about updating your documents and bringing them up to the standards of whatever the current year is in your association. Um, really, the most common reasons to amend an association documents um, are one, that they're outdated, right? Um, I would say that probably 70% of our clients are operating on outdated documents, meaning that the documents were created in the 80s, or the 90s, early 2000s, and they haven't you know, done anything to update them. Um, and why is that important? It's important because there are lots of changes in federal and Arizona laws 
that pertain to associations. Like at the beginning of the presentation today, I mentioned that, hey, there's five new laws. Um, and so every year there have been changes in the law that need to be incorporated into your documents because your documents may conflict with what, you know, your um, your current documents state um, may conflict with what state law says so or federal law says. So, you know, good reasons to amend your documents are, hey, we need it. We haven't done it in the past 10 years and it's time. Um, we need to look at what changes have been made in the law and incorpor incorporate those changes. Um, maybe you're doing things in your association or managing things differently than what your documents say. Like a really good example of this would be parking. Um, a lot of associations have a requirement to enforce on-street parking, and they find it really challenging and difficult to do that um, and expensive if you have to hire a company. And so sometimes the CCNR say that the board's supposed to be doing it, but the board is actually not doing it um, or they're choosing not to do it. Um, so that would be a good example of something where our documents are inconsistent with what our practices are in managing the association right now. Um, another reason to amend your documents is to get rid of all that developer language. Um, your de if your developer is long gone, um, there's really no reason to keep that language in your documents anymore. Um, and it just clean up that language, make it easier for the owners to understand and make it less confusing if, if your developer has uh, moved on and um, is no longer um, in control of your association. Um, another reason to amend the documents is to correct any inconsistencies between, you know, your bylaws and your CCNRs or your articles and your CCNRs. And so a good reason to do that is, um, you know, to you know, make sure that everything is cohesive and the same in terms of the number of directors that are required and um, other things that might be conflicting in those other documents. And surprisingly, we see a lot of conflicts in documents. That's why it's really important to talk about the hierarchy, which we talked about before, because any document that's higher up in the list is going to be um, the document that will be controlling in the event of any conflicts. Okay, um, we have implemented a wonderful five-step plan um, to help associations with amending their CCNRs. And we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. Um, before we do that, I wanna talk a little bit about a case that was decided um, in March of 2022 by the Arizona Supreme Court. Um, this case is getting actually a lot of notoriety in Arizona because it is, it's confusing, frankly. Um, and it is scaring a lot of people into thinking that um, they cannot amend their association documents anymore because of this case. And then the name of the case is the Callway versus Calabria Ranch. And we're going to be sharing with you um, the actual opinion um, in on Zoom and on Facebook Live. So if you want to go back and read it after this seminar, you're welcome to do so. Um, and kind of the purpose of me discussing this case is that there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of scare tactics that are being kind of routed around our industry about amendments to CCNRs in light of this case. And I want to just kind of dissect it and talk about just briefly what it means if you are thinking about amending your association documents. Um, first things first, um, this case was um, a case out of Tucson. And it was an unusual case in that um, it was a very small association. It actually was only a five lot subdivision. Um, and in 2018, what the facts were on this case, um, and again, I'm talking about the Callaway versus Calabria Ranch case. So um, in 2018, several of the owners, so a few of the five owners um, amended the association's CCNRs um, by a majority vote without the callways or the plaintiffs in this case approval or knowledge. Um, so think about it this way. If you, that there's a five person association and three of the five people team up on the other two, you know, owners and they pass an amendment to the CCNRs without their knowledge and without their being able to vote on it or ask questions or express their displeasure with it. These three owners team up and they pass an amendment to the CCNRs and record it. And the amendment negatively affected the callways, who are the plaintiffs in this case, and his lot, 
Um, and his lot was like 23 acres. Um, and so he had a, a large lot. The other owners who were teaming up on him um, and passing the amendment had smaller lots, which were like 3.3 to 6.6 acres. And so they passed something as an amendment to the CCNRs that was detrimental to the callways. And they have the largest amount of land in the community, but they only have, um, you know, their vote. And they weren't even asked to vote on this issue. Okay, so I think one thing that happened here is I think the Arizona Supreme Court was unhappy with the fact that um, these owners who had the majority of the five lots in the subdivision, you know, pass this amendment without letting everybody vote on it and pass an amendment that negatively impacted the callways. Um, and, you know, I think it was, this opinion was frankly, um, in, in my opinion, it was a punishment um, for the specific facts in this case. Um, so I think that's important for us to just say out loud, you know, the facts really dictated the ruling in this case, in my opinion. Okay, so here's what the Supreme Court said in their ruling. Basically, they said that Arizona courts have the authority to blue pencil CCNRs to eliminate grammatically severable, unreasonable provisions. And so basically what they said in this opinion is, hey, we have a blue pencil, the Supreme Court does, and we can go through any Arizona court, um, you know, Superior Court, Appellate Court, Court of Appeals, um, you know, or the Supreme Court can take this blue pencil and we can just strike through and grammatically sever any unreasonable provisions that we think are unreasonable. Um, and if the court determines that language is invalid, we have the right to do that. Um, the Supreme Court also went on to state that the original declaration in this case um, must give sufficient notice of the possibility of a future amendment. That is, amendments must be reasonable and amendments must also be foreseeable to the owners. Um, of course, they didn't define, I mean, reasonable is, you know, that's an eye beholder and also foreseeable. They didn't define what they mean by foreseeable. Um, everybody, after reading this case, everybody in the industry, all the lawyers and management companies, we were all kind of just throwing our hands up in the air and saying, what does this mean? This is really kind of crazy to take this small five lot subdivision and say now that the Supreme Court and other courts can strike through any amendment they don't like, um, that they feel is you know unreasonable. And also CCNRs have to, you know, to have a provision in it that tells owners that, hey, it's foreseeable that this section could be amended and um, you know that the amendments have to be reasonable. So how do we pivot in light of this Colway case? So some management companies and some attorneys are saying, don't do anything. Don't amend your CCNRs. You can't do anything. You know, you're in a straitjacket on this issue. Um, our firm, you know, is not taking that position. Um, I think we have to look at the totality of the circumstances on this case um, and the very unique facts. Um, and I think we have to be smart on how we approach amendments in light of this case. Um, and so basically what, what I would say, my best advice is don't overcorrect. Okay, don't just stop doing amendments. Um, this case is going to be clarified in the future by the Court of Appeals or by the Supreme Court of Arizona. And I think that some of the... Um, some of the language in this case is going to be further defined so that it will be clear that this doesn't mean that you can't amend your CCNRs ever. Um, and, but I do think that, you know, we, we don't want to overcorrect by not doing anything, but I also think that we need to be careful on when we are doing the amendments on how we handle it. Um, and so what we recommend is that if an association is looking at amending their CCNRs, um, we look to see whether or not um, it's foreseeable that that provision could be amended. Um, and one of the things that we look at is, do you have an amendment provision in your documents? Um, you know, is it foreseeable that this provision, um, you know, is going to be amended in light of, you know, changes which may have taken place in the law or statutes that may have, um, you know, been, act been enacted since your last CCNR amendment? And so basically what we do is we analyze, okay, what do you want to change? Um, what does the client or the association's board want to change? And then we do this reasonable test. And is it foreseeable that this section 
was going to be amended to the owners. Um, and we have some language that we put in um, the amendment that helps protect against any potential, um, you know, people that may challenge the amendments based upon the Callaway versus Calabria Ranch. So um, just I wanted to talk a little bit about that case because I know that there are a number of management companies and attorneys that are saying, hey, don't do anything. You can't amend CCNRs anymore because of this case. And, and I think that is an overcorrection. You can still amend your CCNRs, but you just need to be careful how you do it is the bottom line. And talking with your attorney about the reasonableness of the language and the foreseeability of the sections that you want to amend are important topics in that discussion. Okay, let's talk a little bit about our five-step plan. So um, I said earlier in the presentation today that we have been um, I have been working with associations for over 25 years. And during that 25 year period, I have done a lot of CCNR and bylaw and rule amendments. And so what I've done is I've taken the knowledge that I have you know, gained over those 25 years, and I've come up with a, a really effective five-step plan for associations who want to amend their CCNRs. And, um, the plan is a, you know, a map to success to get your CCNRs amended. Um, why is it important that you follow the plan? Because CCNR amendments are time consuming and they are, you know, expensive, frankly. I mean, somebody, you know, always asks me in this presentation, how much does it cost to amend your CCNRs? Well, I, I don't know because I haven't seen your CCNRs. I don't know how old they are. I don't know how many pages they are, um, you know, and so I have to look at the documents um, to, you know, give you an estimate. Um, but it's something that you're going to put time and money and effort into getting it passed. And so if you're going to do that, you want it to be successful. And this is the five step success plan to amend your documents. OK, so the first step um, is kind of the easiest step in the whole process, and that is we need to figure out what is required to amend the documents. So, um, you know, we need to check the specific language of the association's documents. Um, in this five-step plan, just so you know, we have a cheat sheet on this, which if we haven't already, we're gonna be sharing shortly with you. Um, if you wanna follow along, or you can find it on our website at mulcahylawfirm.com. Okay, so step one, check your documents to determine what is required to amend the documents. So. There's typically a provision um, towards the end of the document um, in the CCNRs and the bylaws and the Articles of Incorporation um, that will give us the amendment requirements. So, um, you know, most documents do require a membership vote to amend the documents. So um, the CCNRs, you know, are going to require um, a membership vote. The bylaws typically do require a membership vote as well, although occasionally we'll see that the board can amend um, the bylaws as long as they give notice that they're going to be amending the bylaws and the meeting notice and allow people to attend the open board meeting where it's going to be voted on. Um, the articles typically are amended by the membership vote as well. And then, like I said earlier in the presentation, the rules are typically voted on by the board at an open board meeting. Okay, so the first thing we wanna do, step one, what do we need to amend the documents? We look at the language in the documents. There's an amendment provision. Um, you know, sometimes you need help interpreting the amendment provision because sometimes the language is a little bit unclear. Um, and there is a difference in how it's worded. So you really have to look at the language and think about it. So let's say that um, the language in your CCNR say that um, you know, in order to amend the CCNRs, you need 67% of the votes in the association. Um, and you have 100, you know, votes in the association. That means you'll need 67%, 67 votes, 67%, easy with 100. Sometimes it'll say something like um, you need, you know, 67% of those attending the meeting. Um, if you're like a planned community, you may have a provision like that. That means that uh, attending a meeting of the membership. So that means that you have to first get a quorum at the meeting. And then just those who attend in person or by mail-in ballot, you would need 67% of that number. Um, so it is a little confusing. And why it's the first step is because, um, you know, you got to know 
when you're driving someplace, you got to know the directions, right? And we need to know what number we need to amend each document, um, whether it's a percentage or an actual number, we need that. Um, also important to remember that if you're a condominium, um, there's a special section in the Condominium Act that requires um, that you can't go any lower than 67% of the votes in the condominium to amend the documents. So, um, you know, you will need 67% of the votes um, to amend um, in a condo. Now, if it's higher, if your CCNRs for your condo are higher, then you go with the higher amount. Um, but the benchmark, like let's say your, your condo and um, your documents say 51% to amend the condominium documents, that conflicts with state law. And so you actually need 67%. Um, so if you're a condo, um, just a quick recap on that, um, follow what your documents state for the amendment provisions. If your documents state less than 67%, you gotta go up to the benchmark that state law. For a planned community, there is no benchmark statute. So it's basically whatever your CCNRs say to amend your documents, that's what you go by. Okay, so step one, we're gonna figure out what is the requirement percentage or number to amend our documents. And this is a good time to check in with your attorney especially if it's confusing language in terms of, hey, do we need 67% of all the votes or do we just need 67% of a quorum at a meeting of the membership to amend the documents? Your attorney can help you um, determine what exactly your number is. Okay, step two. Um, this is kind of the longest step, maybe the longest or second longest step in the process. So step two is where we come up with the proposed changes that we wanna to make to the documents. And truly the best way to do this is to um, put the document into a word, put the, put the um, whatever the document is, CCNRs, bylaws, articles into a word document, and then use the track changes function to make changes to the document as you go. Um, I like this because we can keep track of A, who's making the changes, um, and B, when we send it out to the homeowners later for their input and later than that for their vote, um, they can see what the original language is and then what the changes are that we're proposing in a red line format. Um, and there's a number of ways that we can do this. Um, I, I honestly prefer for the board to allow me to um, do the first draft of changes um, to the documents. It's frankly less expensive and easier for me to do the first draft. Um, and basically we just put the documents into a Word document and then I start making my changes. Um, another way that some associations do it is they make the changes and then they bring it to me for me to review the changes that they've made. Um, I'm you know, less enthusiastic about that option because sometimes I spend a lot of time undoing the changes that the board has proposed. Um, and it's, you know, it's, expensive for me and the board to have to undo something. Um, you know, it'd be better for me just to make my changes. And then we talk with the board about their changes. Um, it's a little bit more, um, you know, efficient in terms of time. And it's going to cost you less money in the long run, in my opinion, if you just give the document to your attorney first, let them make their changes. And then we give the document to the board and then they review my changes and they may come up with their own changes. Um, and I take a look at those at that point before they make them. I will typically say, well, what, what, what do you propose or what would you like to do? Maybe send me an email with a listing. And then if something isn't gonna work, I just write back to them and say, hey, this violates the law or this, um, you know, we can't do this because of this, this and this, or, or I actually implement them, you know, into the final document. Um, again, step two, it's important that you have your legal counsel involved during this step um, to help you write up the changes to the amendments to the CCNRs um, because we want to make sure that whatever you're proposing is going to be considered reasonable by a court, right? In light of the Cowley case. Um, and also that it's consistent with what Arizona law currently says or what federal law currently says. Okay, step three is the next step. Um, so, step one, just to recap. What does it take to amend the documents? What's the percentage? Um, step two, we make our changes to the documents. Step three, this is the step that everybody wants to skip, but this is the step that I can tell you after practicing in this area for over 25 years, this is the step you need to do. 
And this step is to take those changes that we came up with in step two and send them out to the homeowners and ask for their input, not their vote. This is just your input. Um, send a cover letter to the owners, say the board has been working on some amendments to the CCNRs or the bylaws. And we want your input on them so that we can um, you know, make sure that we've got a good pulse on how the homeowners feel about these amendments. Um, and so during step three, we educate and solicit community support of the proposed changes, and we receive feedback from the owners about how they feel about it. Now, um, we typically will send out like a comment card with the amendments, um, or if you're doing it electronically, we send the documents electronically and to all owners, and we ask them to email back any comments or suggestions that they may have on the changes. Now, truth be told, you'll be lucky if you get five or 10% of the owners that take the time to look at the documents and give feedback. Um, but the people that do take the time to give you the feedback, they will be a window to how the other owners will be feeling about the amendments. So if you hear feedback, um, and we typically only give like 30 days to give the feedback. If you're hearing negative feedback about you know, implementing a rental restriction or maybe giving the board more authority to raise the assessments to a higher percentage. Um, you know, it's important for us to hear that feedback because it likely will be widespread negative feedback when this goes out for a vote um, with the ballot. And so hearing this feedback at this stage where we can still make some strategy changes is really helpful. So step three, you know, is the time to hear back from our owners that are willing to, to look at it and give us their thoughts and, um, you know, get the word out that, hey, we're doing an amendment to the CCNRs. We want your input. Um, you know, please get back to us with your feedback. OK, step four now is we take that feedback that we get from the owners and we strategize, we have a powwow. I'm typically involved with my client, the board, um, and we're looking at the feedback together in real time, maybe on a Zoom meeting, maybe on a conference call, and we're strategizing. Okay, we got a lot of negative feedback on um, you know, this particular section in the amendments. Should we toss it out altogether? Um, or should we maybe separate that and vote on that separate from the yes or no vote to amend the entire document? Um, and so we do a little strategy thoughts um, on that at this time. And because the worst thing that could happen would be that we send out the amendment as a yes or no vote for the amending the entire document. And people are upset about that one thing and they vote no because of that one thing. And I want to avoid that pain because that will cause the amendment to tank. So we really strategize in step four about how can we effectively get the most amendments passed that we're proposing in light of the feedback that we receive from the owners. Um, at this point, you know, in addition to coming up with what the final language is gonna be for the amendment and maybe segregating um, and separating the vote on a controversial topic or maybe even tossing out that topic. Um, we also come up with what was going to be our plan and a reasonable time frame for the owners to vote on this issue. So at this point, you know, we'll come up with our final ballot. We'll come up with the final language that we plan to use in the actual amendment document. We'll write a cover letter um, asking people to please vote by a certain date. Um, we'll also kind of plan out um, how long we think it's going to take to get the vote. Now, some associations say, hey, we can get this done in 30 days. And, you know, they know their community best. You know, that's fine. We can put a 30 day leash on this for them to, to get back. Um, but more likely than not, I'm recommending when we're strategizing on this to do, you know, somewhere between 90 days or maybe even six months. Um, and I always put in the, the ballot language that the time period to return the ballot can be extended by the board at any time um, during an open board meeting. So if let's say we get to the 90 day mark and we're so close, we're only three votes away and we don't have it, the board can just vote at a regular board meeting to extend it um, to you know, make it a longer time period so we can get those votes that we need. Okay, then step five, um, you've gone through the whole process now. You've um, sent the ballot out to the owners. You've um, given them the language that's being amended. You're getting the ballots back. We're counting them. 
at a certain point, we, you know, how we count them is we typically have an Excel spreadsheet and we have all owners' names listed on it. And we just start uh, monitoring who's voted, who hasn't voted. Um, for people who have not voted, we continue to follow up with them to vote. Whether it's a yes vote or a no vote, we don't care. It's just we're asking you please to vote on this amendment. Um, and then the, the final step is at a certain point, you're gonna hit the threshold number that you need. And once you hit that threshold number or percentage that you need of yes votes to amend the documents, um, then we need to um, record the amendment with the Maricopa County Recorder's Office or whatever county your association is located in. Um, and then that document becomes the final recorded document that you know shows all the amendments to the association's documents. Um, just a practice pointer here. Once you get that threshold percentage that you need, we only have 30 days and this is 30 calendar days to record that amendment under the law. So we really want to keep track of those ballots as they're coming in on a spreadsheet so that we know once we hit that threshold vote so that we can um, you know, record the amendment with the county recorder's office. Okay, what are some um, common problems with CCNR amendments that I want to talk about real quickly? Um, well, first, be careful in determining what percentage vote is required. We talked about that in step one already. Make sure you're talking with your legal counsel so that you're you know, aiming for the correct number um, based upon what your documents state. Um, second thing is we never use a secret ballot for CCNR amendments. So um, you may use secret ballot for you know, election of directors uh, or voting on issues maybe at your annual meeting, but the CCNR amendments are not typically something that is um, the secret ballot is used for. Um, make sure you give your owners enough time to return the ballots. So when you're strategizing in step four, you know, give them plenty of time to return it because sometimes when there's something that's, you know, difficult to read or long to read, people put it aside and they may not vote on it as fast as they would like a ballot for election of directors where they just, you know, check the box for who their candidate is, a candidate is that they want to vote for. So make sure when we're in step four that we're strategizing about how much time we really need to return the ballots and make sure it's a reasonable amount of time to give people the best opportunity to return the ballot. Um, another thing that's important is when we return the ballots, make sure that the record owner signs the ballot and it's not a renter or a non-record owner signing the ballot. We need to have whoever's on the deed, they are the ones that can legally sign the ballot. We can only count that ballot if the record owner signs it. Um, and then last but not least, remember you have 30 days, calendar days after that ballot amendment passes to get that um, amendment recorded with the county recorder's office. Okay, let's briefly talk a little bit about rental restriction amendments. This is like a very popular topic the past you know, seven years about, um, you know, there's been a dramatic increase in the amount of or the number of rental properties in Arizona. Um, I think having the Super Bowl and um, you know spring training and um, our sports teams, you know, bring a lot of people to Arizona as tourists as well as our great weather. Um, and so a lot of associations, um, you know, don't like the nightly rentals in their association or the bachelorette week or whatever. Um, and so basically, what um, associations come to me as they say. Well, can we, our CCNRs have no restriction on rentals. So it doesn't say that there's a minimum time period to rent or it doesn't prohibit rentals. Um, and under Arizona law, if your documents don't have a restriction on rentals, there are no restrictions on rentals and people can rent daily, nightly, whatever, um, weekly, monthly. Um, and that's just the way that our law is structured. Um, and so if you're thinking about doing a rental restriction amendment, um, a couple of things that I would give you some recommendations. Um, number one, you definitely want to get your legal counsel for your association involved um, and make sure that they're helping you write the amendment. We need to look at how many rentals you currently have in the association. So let's say that you currently have 50% of your association is rentals and you need 67% to implement you know, a minimum rental period. 
um, it may be really difficult to get 67% in light of the fact that you have 50% of your demographics are already renting and they may not want to change anything about their rentals. Um, and so it's a good strategy. Like I strategize with the boards about, okay, um, is this even feasible? Like, is this even feasible based upon the demographics in your association that we can get the yes vote? Maybe should we do it through a grandfather clause where we grandfather all owners that are currently renting or maybe all owners period and they can rent unrestricted, but any new owner who moves in is going to be subject to these CCNRs. Um, you know, so there are a number of strategy things that we, we can talk about if you're trying to implement a retro restriction. If you're a condominium, there's a heightened, um, you know, analysis that we need to do because we can't change the use of the property without 100% approval of the membership. And so we need to determine is the amendment that we're trying to implement for rental restrictions, is it a change of use? Like, are we trying to prohibit rentals where they've been allowed before? And how can we potentially structure that so that if somebody challenges this, that um, we we win and you know we, we prevail in a court of law? Um, and so, you know, we have a great cheat sheet that I, I'd like you to take a peek at. Um, the, the back side of the cheat sheet that we gave you on um, the, the five-step plan for amending CCNRs has a great, um, you know, rental restriction amendment summary of the whole process, what state law says, what you can and can't do. So I encourage you to take a look at that. I also would encourage you, if you have a lot of rental properties in your community and maybe you're having problems with them, maybe you're not, we have a great cheat sheet um, on our website too that's called How to Effectively Work with Rental Properties. Um, that just outlines you know, what type of information can you ask from um, the landlord owner um, to be in compliance with Arizona law, what remedies do you have if the landlord owner has a bad tenant in the property, et cetera. So I encourage you to take a look at that. And we're going to be sharing that on Zoom and Facebook Live here today, too. OK, so we've covered a lot of topics here today. Our last topic we're going to talk about is records requests. So how do we handle records requests from an owner? Um, you know, What's the typical, you know, fact pattern that we see for a records request? Um, you know, first, I want to just let you know that we have a great publication that does more of a deep dive on this. Um, and it's our top 10 cheat sheet, top 10 things you need to know about community association law. Number 10 on that cheat sheet is records requests. So we're going to be sharing that with you on Facebook Live and on Zoom here. Um, so you can take a look at that. Okay, what's the fact pattern that we typically see when we have an owner who is requesting records? Um, typically, the owner's upset about something. Um, they're unhappy that their architectural review form was denied um, for a playground. And they want to look at lot five and lot 10 because they have a playground. And I don't know why they're allowed to have it and I'm not allowed to have it. So they want to make a records request for everything in, in the lot files for those other lots. Um, you know, typically it's unhappy, disgruntled owners who are making records requests. Um, you know, and the typical fact pattern is we get an email saying either from the owner's attorney or from the owner themselves saying, I want to see these records. Um, and, you know, a couple of things to think about. Number one, if the owner makes a large records request, like I want 20 years of meeting minutes, 20 years of bank statements, 18 years of, um, you know, the financials for the association. Um, and it's going to take a lot of time, effort, and management company time or board member time um, to look up this information. A strategy that I typically implement will be that I will pick up the phone, give, give me the, the problem. So hand it over to your attorney. Um, and what I will do is I will pick up the phone and I will call the owner and I'm going to talk with them, find out what's upsetting them. Why are they upset? Um, and what specifically, what is the information that they specifically want to find out? And then I help them with what documents specifically they should request. Um, and why is this a smart idea? It's a smart idea because coming up with 20 years of documents is going to take a ton of time and it's not really going to get them the answer that they need, right? It's just going to, it's going to be an avalanche of paper that we have to go through. 
And then it's going to be an avalanche paper that they have to go through and everybody's going to be leaving there feeling frustrated and upset. So I pick up the phone when someone makes a records request and it's a large one. And I say, I listen to them and I listen to them complain about whatever issue they're upset about. And then I ask them, what are you looking for in the documents? What smoking gun, what information do you want that will help you um, better understand something? And, you know, then they tell me and then I say, OK, if I were you, this is what I would request. I'm not your attorney, but you want this information. This is where this information can be to help them recraft the records request. And lots of times it goes from like 5,000 pages of paper that they requested down to three sheets of paper. Um, and it is a much more efficient way to handle things. Okay, that being said, what's, what's the law on records requests? So remember that under Arizona law, owners have a right under the Condominium Act and the Planned Communities Act to basically look at almost all records of the association. So associations should not be playing hide the ball or they can't have that because basically like 95% of all association records are fair game for the owners to ask to see. And they can ask to make a copy of it. So if they want to see a record, they can ask you to make a copy of it. The association can charge 15 cents a page for that copy or the owner can just ask to see um, the actual original document. Um, and, you know, we can't charge if they just want to see the original document. Um, a couple of things come up sometimes that I just want to talk about because these things come up. So if I'm getting a, if we're doing a records request on behalf of a client and the client sends me, um, you know, the financial statement that the owner requested, by email, I just pop it right to the owner by email and I don't charge them 15 cents per page. Um, you know, I think sometimes boards will say charge them because otherwise they'll continue to make these, you know, really large records requests. Maybe that's a consideration. I think it's best just to be nice and just give it to them if you've got it electronically. I mean, if you have to actually make the copy, then yes, I agree. We, we charge them the 15 cents per page. Um, but if it's coming to me electronically, I just push it out, get it to them, and we don't charge them typically. Um, what are some records that um, you cannot have if you're an owner in an association under the law? So you cannot have privileged communication between an attorney for the association and the association. So any sort of writing that's privileged between the association and their attorney, you can't have. Anything pertaining to pending litigation, so litigation that is open um, regarding the association, you can't have. Um, you cannot have executive session meeting minutes, right? Because you're not allowed to be in executive session as an owner unless you're on the board. So you can't have the meeting minutes. Um, you also can't have any records. These, these next two ones are kind of, we don't see as often, but I'm going to mention anyways. Um, you can't have, cannot have personal health or financial records about an individual member of the association, an individual employee of the association, or an individual employee of a contractor for the association. So how often does an association have personal health or financial records on these persons, the owners, employees, or independent contractors? Not very often, um, but there are times like emails would be considered a personal information of an owner. Um, telephone numbers would be considered personal information and owners can't have that. Um, social security number, bank accounts, canceled checks, that's all going to be considered personal information. Um, I, I do not personally believe, it's my opinion, that an owner's lot file has personal information in it, um, you know, meaning like architectural approvals. I think those are fair game um, or architectural disapprovals. The last category is uh, owners also cannot have any records pertaining to the job performance of compensation of health records of or specific complaints um, against employees of the association or independent contractors of the association. Um, and so, you know, if, you know, you can't have, you know, complaints you know, where there's either complaint letters about the contractor or the employee or et cetera. You know, I, I oftentimes will get asked the question, well, what about the management contract? Is that fair game? I think it is. You know, the association has to, or I know it is, the association has to give the 
management contract or any contract vendor contract that you have to the owner. You can redact the compensation under this section that allows us to you know, withhold anything pertaining to compensation of a contractor. However, why would you? Because there's so many other places that the owner can see it. So on the budget, on the financial statement, in the check register. So be practical. Um, you know, you certainly have the right to redact it, blacken out how much you're paying them, but it's probably going to raise a lot more questions and it's going to make it look like we're hiding something. And it can be easily found looking in other places, the budget, the financials of the association, the check register, et cetera. So don't play hide the ball on that. It just doesn't make sense. Okay, so just kind of in conclusion on this records request thing, um, you know, remember one final thing that we cannot charge the owner for the time it takes to put together the records for the records request. So that cannot be passed through to the owner. We can charge 15 cents per page for any copies we make. Um, if the management company is preparing the records and they, they charge for that typically pursuant to their management contract, the association has to pay that charge to the management company pursuant to the contract that they have with the management company. We cannot pass that charge for you know, making the books and records available or pulling the records onto the owner. That's really important. Um, the last thing that's very important is once an owner makes a written request to see records, we have 10 business days to provide those records to the owner. Um, so the day that that records request comes in, you want a calendar that you need to, um, you know, respond within 10, 10 calendar days to that records request. If you have a very large records request and you cannot get the documents together in 10 days, immediately contact the owner as soon as the records request comes in and get it in writing that we received your records request. We need 30 days because we have to go to offsite storage to get the records or whatever. Just document why you need more than the 10 business days. And courts will find that if you immediately respond and you have good reason that, you know, they're going to be more lenient on that 10 business day time period to get the records to the owner. But in the meantime, any records that, you know, are part of that request that you can make available, you know, within the 10 day business period, you should do that. And then if you need a little longer to go to storage or whatever, that's fine. Um, one last thing, how do you handle something if an owner is requesting something that doesn't exist or that used to exist, but it's maybe been destroyed because it's so old? Just tell the truth. It doesn't exist. We don't have that in our records and why. Okay, we also have a great blog on how to handle records requests by owners, which I would encourage you to take a look at um, in addition to our top 10 cheat sheet. Okay, that's it for today. Um, just a few concluding remarks. Um, a few things to mention. Um, we had 127 live viewers on Zoom today um, for this seminar, which is awesome. I think this is like one of our highest uh, participation events. So thanks for being here today. We had many others joining us on Zoom. So we probably our numbers are more like 150. Um, a couple reminders. Don't forget about that free review that we talked about. Um, we spent some time today talking about amendments to CCNRs. Don't forget that our firm offers the um, free 15 minute review of your CCNRs, bylaws, or articles. Um, and, you know, send me an email with the document that you want me to review and give us a couple of weeks to review it. And then we'll get it back to you at no charge with um, our suggestions on the amendment, what it takes to amend. Um, your documents, what percentage, and then an estimate as to how much it costs to amend the documents. Um, that's a really great free service that we're doing, um, and I encourage you to take advantage of it. Um, the next thing I want to remind you of is that we have our next virtual First Friday free call-in on Friday, August 4th at 9 a.m. Um, we do this every month, and I get online on Zoom and Facebook Live and answer your questions for free. We just ask that it's just one question per association, um, and you can submit your questions through 8.45 a.m. on Friday, August 4th, and you can find out more information on this um, on, by contacting uh, me by email or um, by um, contacting our office at 602-241-1093. Um, or signing up to receive our Mulcahy memos, which we send out every week with important information on associations. Okay, next we have our August class for our HOA uh, condo virtual HOA Academy, and that's going to be on Tuesday, August 15th. 
2023. The topic for this class is going to be thoughtful hiring avoids firing. Um, in this class, we're going to talk about management companies and how to select a management company um, and the important role of the community manager and how to work well with man vendors, whether it's your management company or your landscaping company, and how to handle disputes um, with your vendors. Um, and so we're going to kind of all things vendors. Um, we're going to talk about how to hire them and make good choices. How do you deal with them if you have problems? How do you fire them? How do you find a new one? Um, and so we've got a lot of great topics for that um, Tuesday, August 15th class um, of our virtual HOA Condo Academy. Last but not least, it's so important for me to receive feedback as to how we can improve on these classes or if we're doing a good job. Um, and so I'm asking you, please take some time today um, right after this class, do it now. I'm a do it now person. Please consider leaving our firm a Google review. Um, we're going to be sharing a link in the chat on how to leave a review. We are always happy to get feedback from our anybody who's listening to us here today, participating, and also from our clients about how we can continue to improve our service and how we can continue to um, provide good education and practical education for you. Um, the only way I'm getting feedback is if you put something on Google for me and we'll, we read every single one. So I'm encouraging you please to do that um, to help us out. Um, thank you again, everybody, for being here today. Um, we appreciate you caring about your communities and wanting to make them better. And um, I hope you have a great rest of the month. Stay cool as the temperatures get up there. Stay hydrated. And we look forward to seeing you for our classes in August. Take care, everybody. Mm -hmm.